Hello lovely people, welcome back to Fixing Rusty Stuff, where if it ain't broken, I'll fix it till it is. I am about as knowledgeable as a retarded chicken, so please take these videos purely for the entertainment in which they're intended. I see our numbers have swelled to 86. Lovely. Well I hope all 86 here like electricery, because today we're tricking ourselves into thinking we can install an electrical supply into the shed. Now unless you like your own flesh well done and smoking, pissing around with electricity is not something I would recommend and highly advise that before doing any electrical work yourself, you at the very least consult an electrician. <laughs> or better yet, hire one. With that being said, I'm going to start pissing around with some electricity. Without an electrical supply, a man cave is, well, just a cave. And as the English summer days are shrinking faster than my motivation on a Monday morning, it's high time I got power into the shed. That way, I can install some lights and actually see what I'm breaking while I'm breaking it. So in this video, we're going to be doing a little bit of maths and a lot of bit of bodging, while I wire the shed with three circuits, eating, sockets and lights. So where do we start, I hear you ask? Well, in true fixing rusty stuff fashion, I'm going to start at the end and end at the start. Seeing as the end is when you plug an electrical appliance into a wall socket, let's start there. Domestic power circuits usually come in two flavours, radial final and ring final circuits, or as the cool kids call it, a ring main. The difference is simple. With a ring final circuit, you wire the circuit in, well, a ring, meaning the consumer unit colloquially known as a fuse board, has two cables leaving the board running in a big loop. A radio on the other hand has just one cable leaving the board and doesn't return. A bit like my ex-wife. The main perk of a ring final circuit is that it can handle more juice, a bigger current, more butt for your bang. Now I could dive into the mind numbing details of why this works, or quote the electrical regulations at ya, but let's be honest, you didn't come here for a TED talk on budging. All you need to know is that you can usually slap a 32 amp breaker on a ring, whereas the radial circuit gets by with a 20 amp circuit breaker. Mm -hmm. If you're still awake, congratulations, you've officially passed level one of domestic level electrics. Or at least pretend you have to your mates at the pub quiz. I'll be running an obscene amount of electrical devices in this shed cave, and although I'm installing a whopping and completely unnecessary 20 sockets, I won't be running everything at once. So I'll go for a power circuit that can handle around 15 amps, which should be more than enough to power an army of tools, electronic devices and sex robots. Any normal person would centre wire their sockets with 2.5mm square twin and earth cable. But as it goes, I'm about as far from normal as Keir Starmer is from reality. And since I've got a delightful stash of 4mm square cable from a previous bodge job, I'm going to run a 4mm radial circuit and slap that bad boy on a 16 amp breaker. Why? Because I can. And also, because I'm cheap. Just to clarify, those fancy 2.5mm square and 4mm square numbers refers to the cross-sectional area of the cable. But let's pretend we're all electrical geniuses and call this the CSA for short because nothing says I know what I'm doing like an acronym that nobody else understands. I've seen people slap some pretty hefty breakers on 4mm cable, but in some cases, that's like giving a toddler a sledgehammer. Not a great idea. So to prove it, let's dive in at a thrilling world of the on-site guide, the page turner of the century. According to table H2.1 in Appendix H, you can technically stick a 32 amp circuit breaker on a 4mm radial circuit for areas of up to 75 metres squared. But hold up, it ain't that simple. The cable size needed actually depends on its current carrying capacity. You know, how many electrons it can handle before it turns your man cave into a barbecue cave. This is determined by the installation method. I can't see myself using more than about 3 kilowatts on the sockets at any one time in the man cave. So to check the design current, IB, let's go for 3000 divided by 230, domestic voltage, and divide it by 0.9, because why not? 14.5 amps. For some extra bedtime reading, let's jump back to section 7, which has all the juicy details about final circuits. 
including the thrilling fact that the maximum assumed load of a 16 amp 60898 breaker is 14.6 amps. Lovely. Exciting stuff, right? It's like the Da Vinci Code for electricians, but with more maths and fewer priests. In the tongue twist in Appendix F, we can dig into the data for current carrying capacity for copper conductors. I bet you thought we were getting away without any maths there, didn't ya? Or alliteration. Alright, if maths makes you sweat like a politician taking a lie detector test, and you'd rather just watch me drill holes and whack stuff with a hammer, feel free to skip ahead to this part of the video where I get dangerously hands on. You will be missing out on some thrilling equations though. For those sticking around, I promise the maths really won't be that painful. In fact, unless you're the really special kind of stupid, you won't even need a calculator. Luckily, the IET has been kind enough to do most of the heavy lifting for us, and we simply have to read a few tables. Ready? Here we go. All right, first things first, breaker size, IN. It's gotta be bigger than the design current, IB, which we've already figured out to be 16 amps and 14.6 amps respectively. Requirement satisfied. It's like ticking off a to-do list, but with electricity and slightly higher stakes. Now onto the fun bit, calculating IZ, the actual capacity of the cable. It's just IT multiplied by the rating factors. But don't worry, I'll explain. Take a peek at table F6 of appendix F, and you'll see IT which is a tabulated capacity for the cable under specific installation conditions. Here's where it gets spicy. If you're running the cable inside an insulated stud wall where it ain't clipped to the stud work, it's gonna zap nearly 20 amps off its capacity. Yeah, heat does that. This is why proper cable sizing is crucial. Unless of course you're aiming for your man cave to double up as a bonfire. Although the majority of the cable run in my shed is clipped direct, there are parts of the run where the cable is in the stud wall, with the cable not touching any surface except the thermal insulation. So to be safe, we'll use the worst case scenario and take 17.5 as our tabulated capacity IT. As the cable isn't completely surrounded by insulation, we would most likely be perfectly fine using a 20 amp breaker as our means of protection. But let's trust the IET in all their wisdom, because they never get anything wrong. So to get IZ from IT, we multiply IT with the rating factors. CA for ambient temperature, which in this case is 1. CG for cable grouping, as this circuit isn't grouped, also 1. CI for thermal insulation, which, as we're using table F6, is yet again 1. And lastly, CF for the tighter protective device, which for a 60898 breaker is... Can you guess it? Yeah, that's right, it's 1. Now I really hope you don't need a calculator for this, because even my 7 year old niece knows that 17.5 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1 is still 17.5. But if you're sceptical, go ahead, grab your Casio and give it a double check. If you've done things correctly, your figures for each of these i-values should be increasing rapidly. A bit like my frustration at the Labour Party. This little mixture of numbers and symbols means the design current is less than the breaker rating, which is less than the current carrying capacity of the cable. Or, in English, your breaker will trip before your cables get fried. When it comes to electrical design, I am in no way suggesting that these are the only calculations that you need to be concerned with. I mean, don't even get me started on voltage drop. But I think that's quite enough maths for one day, and you'll just have to trust me that I've taken all the necessary steps to ensure that the rest of the installation is fully compliant with BS7671, the British standards that ensure we don't turn this shed into a fireworks display. And now, time for a brief intermission and a video of a high ab lifting a 4.5 ton HV transformer. Right, back to me drilling holes and whacking stuff with a hammer. Once I'd pulled in a healthy dose of 10mm square steel wire armoured cable, fed from the main fuse board of my house and supplied to me free of charge by a dear friend, I fitted grommets in the back boxes, 
slapped them on the walls and pulled cable to every corner of the cave. Cue montage with upbeat music, sawdust flying and me pretending to know what I'm doing. <laughs> Bloody hell, that was hectic. To match the two million sockets, I also wired enough lights in this man cave to rival the luminescence of a thousand suns. Good for seeing what I'm doing and great for a free tan. After the joyous task of cable pulling, I went full pro and labelled the cables at each switch with what can only be described as alien-esque hieroglyphics. Because let's be honest, you don't want to play guess the wire when it's time to terminate. It's always nice to clip the cables as neat as possible. Or you can just throw the cable, hammer and some clips at the wall like I did. Once I wired all socket switches and lighting points with what felt like 25 kilometers worth of electrical cable, I let myself loose on the fuse board. I slapped on a couple of grommets, threw it against the wall and prepared to terminate the armored cable. Now lucky for you, I prepared a very detailed and incredibly professional how-to for glanding armored cable. And it goes a little something like this. You start with a little bit of choppy choppy, followed by a touch of cutty cutty, and just a sprinkle of unwindy. Then you slide on the big black condom. Oh, sorry, the pros call it a shroud, but we all know what it looks like. Burnish the fuse board with aftergland and gently slide the other half onto the cable's girth. Yup, that's right, I'm going there. More cutty cutty, followed by some twirly whirly magic. Feed that cable girth gently into the hole, steady now. Tighten the gland and snugly cover it with the condom. And for the grand finale, you peel back the remaining cable's foreskin and you got yourself a true masterpiece in the art of electricery. Once that's sorted, it's time to start stripping the remaining cables and terminating them into the appropriate spots in the fuse board. By the end, you should have something that hopefully looks better than an explosion in a spaghetti factory. Get those blue wires snugly into the neutral bar, the earth cables sleeved and cotching up in the main earthing terminal, and the line cables nestled neatly into their corresponding breakers. Make sure you use a torque screwdriver to get those terminals to just the right level of tightness. Whereas usually I use the torque setting of VFT, if you know you know, I'll go with a manufacturer's recommendation this time. Lovely. I'm afraid that's all we have time for in this episode, lovely people. So to leave you like a cliffhanger on an episode of EastEnders, will the second fix and final testing reflect a perfect and flawless installation? Or will it reveal some amateur level errors? Will my earth resistance be low and my insulation resistance be high? Or will the whole installation be deemed a safety hazard? For now, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for watching. If you found that in the slightest bit entertaining, electrocute that like button, terminate the subscription button, share it with your favorite sex robot, and stay tuned for the next installment of Fixing Rusty Stuff.